We are almost on our third year of marriage. Some of you might think why we are here. We know too little. Well, our marriage is doing fine. As long as we stay in love, our relationship will get by and we do not need any help. So why are we to speak here anyway? Because that's what we thought and that most of you would agree that is certainly not true. When we were still yet new, we enjoyed each other's company as husband and wife. Our love for each other was intimate that we can not over ever think that something could go wrong. Until our differences arise and expectations for each other are not met. A petty quarrel could lead to world war and a single misunderstanding can cause a cold war for days. One day, a fight over a hair conditioner led us to shouting at each other at top of our lungs. Imagine how a single pin could make a balloon burst. That's how vulner vulnerable we were. And just as we thought our love was strong enough, God showed us otherwise. November of 2013, we were invited to attend a couple's retreat. We were pretty much excited and thoughtful of what else could we possibly learn that we still don't know. Of course, there's lots of things we don't know, but since we're working our marriage this fine, then we'll see. We did not expect to be so ignorant, knowing that we already are Christians and was attending couples D group. We were finally awakened that although we seem fine, God led us into showing how we really are, how our relationship was, how reality bites, and how we are failing as husband and wife. Having no structure in a marriage can easily be broken down by a simple blow. As we discussed each other's no roles, I was slapped with Ephesians 5.22 that wives submit yourselves to your husbands as to the Lord, and Ephesians 5.33 that wives must, ex must respect her husband in the beginning, I thought that loving my husband and serving him is sufficient. Don't get me wrong, because loving and serving is a very important role, and respect has an equally vital part, because every time I break his rules, every time I tend to neglect to follow his ways and tend to overrule his decisions, because women as we are, we think we know best, all of, the, all of those things are disobedience to our Heavenly Father. As Paul said in Ephesians 4, 1-4, to Therefore I, a prisoner for serving the Lord, beg you to lead a, a life worthy of your calling, for you have been called by God. Always be humble and gentle. Be patient with each other, making allowance for each other's faults because of your love. Make every effort to keep yourselves united in the Spirit binding yourselves together with peace. For there is one body and one spirit, just as you have been called to one glorious hope for the future. We are indeed thankful to the Lord Almighty who was able to speak to us through attending the retreat. For we are able to serve each other better as well as serve the Lord together at our very best. And so, by God's grace and wisdom, gave us a D-group to lead. Now we can say that our marriage is on track under a structure, structured by God. It is not without flaws, for without it, we would not learn God's truth. And though God's, and through God's love overflowed in us, it will be unscarred. In Ecclesiastes 4.12, it says, A person standing alone can be attacked and defeated, but two can stand back to back and conquer. Three are even better, for a triple-braided cord is not easily be broken. God tell us this that marriage is a gift from above. You can enrich it. It is designed to last, designed to withstand against all odds. I'm Titus, and this is my wife, Sariza, serving the Lord with all our hearts, and still a work in progress. To God be the glory, honor, and praise. Right, here we go. 
All right, friends, I cannot overemphasize the importance of this retreat for your married life. And so, again, we are inviting you to please do come or attend or even if you have friends who are married, please let them know. We have some invitations there. Please encourage them to attend. Okay, so before we go to our message, let's pray for the activities and even for Saisa or Titus and Saisa as God will work in their life. Let's pray. Father, Lord, thank you. Thank you for giving us all these opportunities. The Women's Conference, the Overflow, Overflow Leadership Conference, and Lord, the Couples Retreat, Lord God. We also pray for the ongoing Singles Retreat in Buddha, that you would bless the singles there, Lord God. We pray also, Lord, for uh, each and everyone who are here, Lord God, that you would bless us today and speak to us, Lord God, in a mighty, profound, personal way, Lord God. Again, I pray, as we come to you, Lord God, we give to you everything, our senses, everything, Lord God, we want just want to focus on you, to you, Lord God. And Lord, I pray for myself that I'll just hide behind your cross, hide behind your power, Lord God, that you would use me to speak to your people today. In Jesus' name we pray. Everybody say, Amen. Amen. Good morning, everyone, once again. And uh, if there is anyone here who is your first time, can you just show your hand? We don't want to embarrass you, but we want to welcome you. Is there anybody here for the first time? All right. Okay. There's, okay, we want to welcome you. We are Christ Commission Fellowship, and I'm going to be your messenger boy for today. And I am tasked to actually talk about Genesis chapter 45. As you know, we have been running the story of Genesis, and today we are dealing with the life, particularly in the life of Joseph. Okay, so before we go there, if you have your Bibles with you, you can turn it to chapter 45. And if you have your gadgets with you, you can just click on chapter 45. Before we go to the message, I'd like to make some mental exercises. Mental exercise, all right? I want to show you a picture. I want you to tell me what you see, okay? Uh, what do you see? A frog, all right, a frog. But if I tilt this picture, if I kind of tilt this picture, what do you see now? Of course, you probably saw this in Facebook, right? Um, many are stalkers here and active. Okay, I bet you have not seen this. What do you think this is? Galing nyo? In English, galing nyo. Okay, but if you tilt that picture, you would actually see a what? A bunny, right? Kanina, ano yun? Let me just go back quickly. A what? A head of a? Oh, pero ang iba, they already saw the rabbit, right? So, very good. Very good. You tilted your head instead of the... Now, another example is this. There was a professor and in his class, he wrote down a raw sentence and it says like this. A woman without her man is nothing. So he called all his male students and he said, Men, put punctuation marks on this and how you would see this sentence read. All right? So all the men came and they put punctuation marks in this way. A woman without her man is nothing. Tama, men? No, of course no, because you're biased. Okay, so the women came and they put punctuation marks. A woman without her, man is nothing. <laughs> See, it changes everything. It's a matter of perspective. You know, the horse and the frog, when you tilt the picture, it's a matter of perspective. The duck head, and if you turn it and becomes a bunny, it's a matter of perspective. When you put punctuation points or punctuation marks, it's a matter of what? Perspective. Now, just for fun, a uh, boy wrote this down. Okay, he says, let's eat, grandpa. And then a bully took out the comma, let's eat, grandpa. That, that's just for fun, okay? The lesson here is, commas save lives. <laughs> Alright, but again, it's a matter of perspective. Why am I talking about perspective? 
Because in chapter 45, if there is something that you would remember Joseph of, it is his godly perspective. In fact, it's a very well-known verse in Genesis chapter 50, verse 20. Joseph said, For you meant evil against me, but God meant it good. And so for today, the title will be Joseph's Legacy, Godly Perspective. This is something we can remember Joseph about. It's how he sees things, you know, as he tilts his circumstance, he sees a godly perspective. That's what we're going to talk about today. And while, how we would approach this chapter is that we will go through the whole of the chapter. It's only 26 verses. And we will pick out observations from how Joseph had a godly behavior because he had a godly perspective. Because a godly perspective will result to godly attitude. Godly attitude would result to godly choices. And godly choices would result to godly behavior. And this, we will, not, we will follow or we would look at Joseph's life as he models godly perspective and how he demonstrated it. Because I pray that today we would learn something from this. And I believe, I believe sincerely that God's scripture or God's principle is not only timeless, it is also timely that we can use in our life. <coughs> Excuse me. Okay? So, before we go forward, let me just recap the life of Joseph. Alright? The life of Joseph goes this way. He is um, a brother of 11 brothers, or 12 brothers, and one sister. He is actually a favored son. And he had a dream. He had a dream that his brothers would bow down to him, even his parents. And his father was playing favorite, and he favored jo Joseph so much that he gave him a tunic, an expensive tunic, a coat rather. And just, you know, in context that you would imagine how expensive it was, it's just like he was wearing an Armani suit, and his brothers were wearing just ordinary t-shirts. And so his brothers hated Joseph so much that they despise him that they don't want to talk to him. In other words, they had like this, sometimes we do, they don't talk to each other because they just hate him so much. And one day they conspired to kill him, but by the grace of, by, by the sovereignty of God, they didn't kill him, but they actually sold him because there was an Ishmaelite trader that passed by. And so they sold him and he became a slave in Egypt, and his boss was Potiphar, the captain of the soldier or the the palace guards. Now, Joseph, or God was with Joseph that he was successful in running the house of Potiphar. And every day, Potiphar's wife was seducing him because Joseph was handsome. And because Joseph was fearing God, he actually did not give in to that temptation. Although he was tempted every day. Imagine, guys, tempted every day with a, you know. But, because God was with him and he feared God, he had a victorious uh, life within that department of his life. But because his wife or Potiphar's wife was, you know, constantly seducing him, he then falsely accused Joseph and Joseph was thrown into prison. But because of God's intervention, God then again sent two VIPs, a cupbearer and a bread maker. And so the cupbaker of Pharaoh and bread maker of Pharaoh. And they had a dream which comes from God and he interpreted it and it was fulfilled. One day, the Pharaoh also had a dream and the dream nobody can interpret. The wisest man in the land, magicians, nobody. And then the cupbearer remembered Joseph. Joseph was forgotten but cupbearer Cup better said, there is one who can interpret dreams. And then Joseph interpreted it. And we all know the story. He became the prime minister of the most powerful nation at that time. Now, famine came. After five years of abundance, famine came. The family of Jacob suddenly said, go to Egypt, get some food because we're running out of supplies. And so they went there. Joseph recognized his brothers, but the brothers did not recognize him. And so he sent them back, and then 
Joseph said, if you're coming back here, bring Benjamin, your youngest son. And so their supplies ran out in Canaan, and Jacob said, go back to Egypt. But they said, we cannot go back there unless we bring who? Benjamin. And so Benjamin went, and from there, Joseph tested his brothers, and he said, Benjamin should, will, will stay, or actually be prisoned because he took the, the, the silver cup. And so, the end of chapter 44, it says there, Judah was now pleading. He was saying, Prime Minister, take me instead. My father is old, and he will die if he does not see Benjamin. And there, Joseph saw that his brothers were already had or already had a repentant heart and we'll pick up from there in chapter 45 and chapter 45 mean comes i mean and chapter or verse 1 says it says there then joseph could not control himself before all those who stood by him and he cried have everyone go out from me so there was no man with him when joseph made himself known to his brothers meaning there were no more egyptians inside that room only his brothers, the Hebrew brothers. And so, in verse 2, it says here, So, he wept so loudly. He wept so loudly. Let me just stop there. Okay? The second most powerful man in the world wept so loudly. Imagine, just imagine that supercharged emotion at that time. Let me just bring you, bring you to a picture here in our context. Just imagine, our mayor summoned you to his room. And a couple of months ago, he was scolding you of something. And now he calls you, and suddenly he says, everybody, get out of the room. Get out of the room. And then he sobs and wept so loudly. What do you think you would feel? Well, that's probably the same feeling that the brothers had. I mean, Joseph wept so loudly that his weeping was heard on Pharaoh's household. Amazing. He sobbed so loudly, probably so long, he just wept and wept. Ah, oh, this, this is an emotional scene. Probably one of the most emotional chapters of the Bible. Second probably only to God or Jesus' passion on the cross. And he says, wept, and then suddenly, in verse 3, then Joseph said to him, his brothers, after he wept, he said to his brothers, I am Joseph. Is my father still alive? But his brothers could not answer him, for they were, what? Dismayed. Now, the dismayed here, let me just go quickly what the word dismayed is. The dismayed here is like a picture of a soldier going to a battle. And when he sees that he is surrounded by armies of his enemies, he would say, Patay kang bata ka. I'm doomed. It's the same thing as they felt. Dismayed means troubled. They are inwardly palpitating. We have sold this guy before. We tried to kill him before. And now he is a powerful man. They were agitated and they were just there, alarmed and afraid. They could not answer. But look at Joseph in his response also. Then Joseph said to his brothers, Please come closer. Please come closer that you would recognize me. Please come closer that we become intimate. Please come closer so that I would not yell at you. I am your brother Joseph, whom you sold into Egypt. I am he. And I'm not discounting the fact that you sold me. You did wicked things. But he comforted them on the next verse and he says, Now, do not be grieved and angry with yourself. Why? Because you sold me here for God sent me before you. Joseph, the most influential, powerful man, let's just say, just next to Pharaoh, 
He had all the power in the world to just be bitter to these guys. It is his time to really take revenge and say, Aha! In Filipino, we always say, Sa akin ang huling halakhak. In English, laughter is the best medicine. <laughs> he had that chance, right? But look, look how Joseph attributed all of his experiences and he said, you know what? You did sell me. But the truth is, the sovereign God, Elohim God, the most powerful God, sent me rather than you. God interposed. God intervened in your wickedness. You meant it bad, but God meant it good. Because God has a purpose for me to fulfill. And number one, it is to preserve life. The next verse, he says, to preserve life because for the famine has been in the land these two years and there are still five years in which there will be neither plowing nor harvesting. And so, God sent me before you to preserve for you a remnant in the earth and to take and to keep you alive by a great deliverance. Joseph understood his success because he had a godly perspective. You know what? You did sell me. You did want to kill me, but God sent me. He caused this everything. He caused me to be in this office for three reasons. To preserve life, to preserve for you a remnant in the earth, the children of the chosen people of God, and thirdly, to keep you alive by a great deliverance. He understood that because he didn't see just the circumstance, you know? It's like what, what he could probably just be bitter. Like, you sold me. I was there in the prison. Where were you? He stole my tunic. He could be, you know, he could be just be telling all those things. But you know what? No. This is how I see it. You see a horse. I see a frog. You see a frog. I see a horse. Perspective. Now, therefore, it was not you who sent me, but who? God. And he has made me a father to Pharaoh and Lord of all his household, ruler over all the land of Egypt. My position is God's handiwork. So what can we learn from this? All right, I just want to remind you what we're, how we would approach this is that we would pick up observations first. And later on the... Uh, end part of the message, we would now try to apply all these principles in our lives. The first observation I want to suggest to you is this. Joseph embodied God's sovereignty and purpose. He actually was an embodiment of God's sovereignty and purpose. You know, Jesus had a, or Joseph, I mean, had a lot of detours in his life. He had a dream and knew it will happen. He was specializing in interpreting dreams anyway. He knew that God would one day fulfill that dream that his brothers and even his parents would bow to him. Joseph was able to focus on God about that and he did not waver. Despite the detours, his brother conspiring to kill him, his boss's wife seducing him, you know, all of those things falsely accused, forgotten by the royal servants, these were detours to the fulfillment of his dreams. These were not setbacks. Instead, these were ways that brought him to the right place at the right time as God does sovereignly plan. God prepared the dreamer for the dream. And despite the pains and the adversities and the sufferings, Joseph became better, not bitter. He looked at it at the perspective of God. God sent him to Egypt for a purpose. And what that, that was to save people's lives. Joseph, the dreamer, was also ready for forgiveness and reconciliation. Friends, we can see that Joseph was being readied for something great. And I love this quotation from Martin Lloyd-Jones. The worst thing that can happen to a man is to succeed before he is ready. That's probably the worst thing. And 
we know as we have looked in Joseph's life that he was in the boot camp of life as he was being as God has read, was readying him. He was in the dungeons. He was under the pit. Every oppression, every mental and physical suffering he could learn, he did go through that process. But God was always with him. The second thing that I want you to uh, note as an observation of our scripture today is that Joseph carried out God's purpose. Joseph carried out God's purpose. Let's proceed to the verse. In verse 9, it says there, Harry, and go up to my father and say to him, Thus says your son Joseph, God has made me Lord of all Egypt. Come down to me and do not delay. Now, Joseph understood his purpose for his influence and power. He had the purpose to save lives, to preserve a remnant. Now, Joseph actually had a marching order for his brothers to go up to his father and hurry up. You know why? Because you shall live, he said, you shall live in the land of Goshen. You shall be near me and your children and your children's children and your flocks and your herds and all that you have. And there I will also provide for you for there are still five years of what? Famine to come. And your household and all that you have would be impoverished. He said, now is my time to do this because this is my purpose. Now hurry up, go to my dad, go to your place, bring, him, bring them all up here because here I'll provide for you because if you stay there in Canaan, what would happen to them? They will be impoverished and they could probably die. And that would not be the purpose of God why he is in that office. Are you with me? Okay, so Joseph carried out. He had that sense of urgency of his purpose. And he started. He gave that marching orders to his brothers. Behold, your eyes see and the eyes of my brother Benjamin see that it is my mouth which is speaking to you. He said, this is my order to you. I, Joseph, am telling you to do this. Now, you must tell my father of all my splendor in Egypt and all that you have seen, and you must hurry and bring my father down here. Now, some commentaries are saying Joseph was trying to brag about his position. But in light of Joseph having a godly perspective, I don't think so. He's trying to say, look at my life. Despite all things that happened to me, God's hand is still with me. And he's a sovereign God, and I trusted him. You also should trust God also. So bring my father down here. The third observation I want you to see is that Joseph displayed true forgiveness and reconciliation. In chapter or verse 14, then he fell on his brother Benjamin's neck and wept. And Benjamin wept on his neck. Verse 15 he kissed all his brothers and wept on them. And afterward, his brothers talked with him. Now, there's an amazing clause here that says, and afterwards, his brothers talked with him. It speaks volumes, by the way. If you remember Joseph when he was still a teenager, his brothers despised him so much that they did not, what? Talk to him. Now, when there's true forgiveness and true reconciliation, as Joseph displayed this by kissing his brothers and wept on them, his brothers talked to him. Do you understand now? There is a superficial reconciliation and true reconciliation. In this matter, there was already an open communication. If we imagine, 22 long years and probably 14 years ago, they have not talked. But because of true reconciliations, the brothers talked with him. I love this quotation. The re remarkable thing about Joseph's life was not his brilliance. It was, his, it was not his administrative ability. Although he was gifted there, it was his attitude, especially in response to unfair treatment. And the reason for his 
attitude was his relationship to the sovereign God. He initiated the reconciliation. He wept. He made the gesture. He kissed them. And true reconciliation was displayed if you have a godly perspective. And I tell you from the scripture, true and authentic and genuine reconciliation, can, people can smell it a mile away. Look at what happened. Now, when the news was heard in Pharaoh's house that Joseph's brother had come, it pleased Pharaoh and his servants. People will know if that reconciliation is true or not. And in this case, Pharaoh knew that his brothers came. It's just not a matter of just uh, brothers arriving. Pharaoh knew that there was real reconciliation. Some markers of real reconciliation is that people around you will be happy. Some markers of superficial reconciliation, people will not believe in you, that you really reconcile. But then again, because Pharaoh believed in that part, then Pharaoh said to Joseph, Say to you, brothers, do this. Load your beast and go to the land of Canaan and take your father and your households and come to me. And I will give you the best of the land of Egypt and you will eat the fat of the land. Pharaoh just reiterated the assurance that you will have the best of the land here in Egypt. Take your father. Bring them here. You will be taken care of. Now your order, do this. Take wagons from the land of Egypt for your little ones and for your wives and bring your father and come. Do not concern yourselves with your goods for the best of the, all the land of Egypt is yours. Wow. When people see that there's true reconciliation, true forgiveness, they will bless you. That's just what happened to Joseph. Primarily because he had a godly perspective. Finally, what we can pick up from the story of Joseph is this. Joseph won his family for God. Joseph won his family for God. Then the sons of Israel did so, and Joseph gave them wagons according to the command of Pharaoh and gave them provisions for the journey. To each of them, he gave changes of garments. By the way, let me stop there. Remember when he was still a teenager, they took his what? Tunic. They took his garment, splattered it with blood, making it a evidence to their dad that Jake or Joseph is already dead. But this is Joseph's initiative. He gave them what? Garments. It's just like, you took my garment before, I'm going to give you garments now. Why? Because this is a new start for us. But to Benjamin, he gave 300 pieces of silver and five changes of garments. To his father, he sent as follows, 10 donkeys loaded with the beast, or loaded with the best things of Egypt, and 10 female donkeys loaded with grain and bread and sustenance for his father on the journey. So, he sent his brothers away, and as they departed, he said to them, this is his final, this is his final encouragement, or this is his, 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 his admonition to them. He says, do not quarrel on the journey. Now, this is interesting. Why would Joseph say to the brothers, do not quarrel on the journey? It's just like this. He's saying, okay, along, when you go back to your dad, wag kayo mag-away, ha? Okay? In English, do not quarrel. Okay? Why? Why would he say that? It's because this is the reason why. I made a little bit of research on this. He says, the word quarrel here means to fall out. Joseph is saying, don't fall out. Don't move. Don't be provoked. Don't be troubled. Don't be, don't quiver with violent emotions, especially anger or fear. You know, the reason behind it is this. These brothers had spread the lie that Joseph is already what? Dead. Now, Joseph is telling them, go to your father and tell him that Joseph is alive. Along the way, they would probably say, 
Who's going to tell who? Dad. They would probably say, it's because of you, you wanted to kill him. Along the way, they could be disunited. Along the way, they could quarrel. Along the way, they could, there are many things that could happen. They could blame each other. They could be angry with each other. But Joseph said, don't quarrel. Because Joseph wanted to win his family for God. Don't you think that Joseph could have just, just commanded his chariots, go pick up my dad in Canaan? He could have just told his servants, go, go to Canaan, get my dad. Brothers, stay here. But you know what he did? He sent his brothers. Why? For them to really experience that God is true. God is real. God is working in their lives. And don't quarrel. Be united. Are we on the same page? He wanted to win his parents or he wanted to win his family for God. And then, they went up from Egypt and came to the land of Canaan to their father, Jacob. They told him, saying, Joseph is still alive. I don't know how they would say this, like, Joseph is still alive. Or probably they could have just text Jacob, jo Joseph is still alive. Or emailed him. No. They told him personally. And not only Joseph is alive, he is ruler of the land of Egypt. But, Jacob was stunned and he could not believe them. Now, the word stunned there means he was sluggish. He was feeble. He was about to faint. He's like, what? For 22 long years? I believe that he was dead. But now he's alive and he's not only alive, he's also one of the most powerful men in the world. And he would not believe his brothers. Why? For 22 long years, they were telling him that he was dead. Why would he believe them now? But Joseph did something. He sent, remember, he sent some wagons and all of those stuff, some gifts. And so verse 26 says there, When they told him all the words of Joseph that he had spoken to them, and when he saw the wagons that Joseph had carried him, the spirit of the father, of their father Jacob, what happened? Revive. Totoo talaga. He is alive. Not because his brothers told him, but because, you know, Joseph did something. He wanted to win his family. Then Israel said, It is enough. My son Joseph is still alive. I will go and see him before I die. Right? That is the story. So let me just go and make a recap of our observations. Then, we will make some applications. Number one, Joseph embodied God's sovereignty and purpose. He knew that God was working in his life. Of all the circumstances, he tilted that picture and saw otherwise. And now he is in that office. Now he is successful. Now he passed all the trials. He passed all the trainings. He now says that, Lord, you have sent me here. And you have sent me here because I have a purpose. And second point is that Joseph carried out God's purpose. He didn't wait till tomorrow or he did not, you know, tarry. I don't know the length of the duration of this, but it was his marching order to carry out God's, to, to his brothers to carry out that purpose. Thirdly, Joseph displayed through forgiveness and reconciliation. And again, people will know true reconciliation and forgiveness is. Fourthly, Joseph won his family for God. This is Joseph's legacy. He had a godly perspective. This is how he behaved because he had a godly perspective. Now, let's bring that. Let's bring that principles in our time now and how we can apply all of those in light of what we learn in Scripture and let's try or even do an application in our part. Okay? And so, uh, I'd love to make some acronyms when uh, doing this study and I was praying to God Lord please Lord give me a word perspective is too long and so God gave me a synonym and he said perspective and view is what it's the same you probably can change it change it Joseph's legacy he had a godly view he sees things in the eyes of God he sees things in how God would work he related everything to him he related everything to a sovereign God and he submitted to a sovereign God. 
Alright? So let's, these are suggestions. You can agree with this. But I pray that you would take this, this week, and apply it. And ask yourself, what's my view? Alright? So, letter V. Let me give you this first application point. Oops. Letter V. Verify God's sovereignty in your life. Verify God's sovereignty in your life. This means that have an introspect of your experience and relate it to God's sovereignty. God had been directing and redirecting you. God has been allow us allowing being, God has been allowing people to to offend you and oppress you probably. But make an introspect. Why is this happening? Why is God moving me from one place to another? Why is a boss why am I having a boss who is a slave driver? Why, why is this life of mine a mess? But if you look into your experience, you can see that God's hand is working in your life. He is actually preparing you for a better place. He's making you ready of a higher calling. As you look into your life, confirm that where you are right now is where actually God wants you to be. God is readying you for something bigger than what you think it is. He's preparing and grooming you for a purpose. Friends, I don't know about you, but let me share to you one instance in my life, in my family's life. We don't understand, one day we did not understand what was happening, but God was really shaking us. Um, by the way, I live, we live, my family lives in Turil. It's like 300 hours from Turil to downtown. It's just, traffic is just messy. And you know, it's just, it's a tiresome thing to traverse that highway. And every day we would come here to CCF, serve God's people. That's, that's, that was our life. And I have a child who was entering, I had a daughter entering college, and sometimes she would come home 9 o'clock in the evening because sometimes when she rides the public transportation, it takes her two, two hours, a half, one hour and a half to get there. And so one day uh, we were having trouble because our house, we were live in a second floor building, and there's a strip of road there that the motorcycles would use as a strip for drag racing. So every one o'clock or two o'clock, we would hear the broom broom of the broom broom. Burn, 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 burn. So I would wake up one o'clock in the morning and I feel sluggish in the, uh, the next day. And so finally, our house and the front, uh, the front of our house, which is also an old house, they were renovating the second floor. And they were putting up, believe it or not, a live band. <laughs> and so our room was just like here, and the live band was just like there at the booth. So every night I would we and their you know their theme was reggae. <laughs> it's just amazing. And so they would end up three o'clock in the morning. And I myself, I, oh, I, I probably bought all the earplugs in the world, but it could not just help me. So every 10 o'clock, because the law says 10 o'clock, no more noise pollution, right? So every 10, 10 o'clock, I pick up my phone and call 911. And so I call 911 almost every night. And so the police comes, and they stop the live band, and then after 15 minutes, reggae again. <laughs> all right? And so I call again 911. It's, it happened like three months or so. And so we, we didn't understand until such time that I complained it's in Barangay. We, you know, come face to face and all of those things happened. And suddenly one of the owners called me and says, why don't you live in the mountains? Ako pa tong pahawaon? We lived there for so many years and they want us to leave because they have their reasons. But anyway, we were asking, Lord, why is this going on? And sometimes drunk people would go into our house asking me to stop calling 911. <laughs> and so my, 
I, I saw a, a, a danger path there because my daughter would come 9 o'clock, 9.30 in the evening and drunk people would come into our house and I was, you know, kind of thinking baka they would make in it, in it to me, right? In English, hot, hot. Okay? So, Lord, we've been praying, Lord, what, what, what should we do? I mean, this is, we all have the right to, to, to stay here. They probably should leave. Actually, we went to Barangay, we, were, we talked to the Barangay, and my wife and I decided, you know what, let us leave. So we moved to Davao City, God uh, opened a door for a, an apartment, and then suddenly one of our relatives, who is also from CCF, left for the States, and he, you know, he, he rented, he, he, she, want, she let us rent her house, and so we saved gasoline, we saved all those problems traversing, and we are now here, we're close to CCF, three minutes, five minutes, and we are now doing his purpose for his family and us. That's the reason why God was moving. He was shaking us. Okay, listen to reggae every day, but Lord, I want gospel music. But then again, that's why. And God's hand is there. If you want to see the picture, tilt the picture. The circumstance does not really tell you know, it's, there's more than that circumstance. You'll see through it. Okay? Secondly, uh, by the way, Apostle Paul tells us, we know that God causes all things to what? Work together for good to those who love Him and to those who are called according to His. It does not say some things. It says all things. It may be good, it may be bad, not too good, not too bad, but all things will work together for good. For His purpose. Always be reminded it is His purpose. Second, or by the way, Rick Warren said, God allows you to go through painful experiences to equip you for ministry to others. He allows those things to happen so that you'd be able to have a personal you know, you can relate to it personally to others. Second is that letter I, implement God's purpose. Implement God's purpose. Remember, Joseph, he didn't tarry. He said, this is my marching order. Go, bring my dad, bring our dad here because that is my purpose, to preserve life. And this, my friends, is our application. Implement God's purpose. But I want to go back a little bit because... The question really that we need to reflect is, what is your vision of God's purpose for you to carry out? If we don't know God's purpose for us to carry out, that would be a big problem, right? So I pray that God, you would, you would have a purpose to carry out. We all have purposes. Man, life without a purpose is, I don't know, it's just probably so futile. But then again, Look for God's purpose. And if you have God's purpose, focus on it. Because it is difficult to fulfill God's purpose for your life if you are focused on your own plan. And sometimes God gives you the purpose, but you kind of struggle. No, Lord, I don't want that. I have other plans, like I want to get married. But God has a purpose for you. Focus on that. Thirdly, experience forgiveness and I want to put there true forgiveness and reconciliation. If you have some problems with your family, experience it. This week, you need to have a godly perspective that this is God's will for us to be reconciled. Actually, for Christians, this is not actually just a suggestion. This is a command. Jesus himself said in John 13, 35, By this all men will know that you are my... If you are a disciple of Christ, you need to reconcile. If you have... You are my disciples if you have love for one another. It takes... If you love one another, you would reconcile, correct? Let me leave to you this quotation that I really would... would I really like. You know, as you restore relationships, may a watching world learn of God's love. Just like Pharaoh, 
He smelled true reconciliation a mile away. People will see that there is true reconciliation in you. You can't fake it. You can't. And as you do, as you restore relationship, may the watching world, may the unbelievers see or learn God's love. Would that be a good encouragement for you to restore relationships? It's also a good application that we can do this week. Finally, in letter W, win. Win your family for God. Do something. Initiate something for your family. Joseph had the power to send these troops, to send all the carriages, but he sent his family to win them for God. Use those to win them for God. Now, as a closing remark or a closing thought, you see, having a godly perspective, having a godly perspective is actually not hard. It is actually impossible. I mean, you can't do all of these things on your own. You can't tilt the picture. You can't verify. You can't implement. You can't experience. You can't win family for God on your own. You know why? Because these are spiritual things. These are foolishness to those who don't have the Spirit. You see, in 1 Corinthians 2.13, it says there, the person without the Spirit does not accept the things that come from the Spirit of God, but even consider them foolishness and cannot understand them because they are discerned only through the Spirit. You know, having a godly perspective on our own, we can do it. First of all, it's godly. And so we need the Spirit. And some of you would think, ah, oh, that's, I heard of that before. That's foolishness. Could it be possible that the Spirit of God is not in you? That's why you cannot see the godly perspective. You can only see the surface. But then again, there's good news. You can. You can by the help of the Holy Spirit. Because Paul said in Ephesians, he says, In him you also, after listening to the message of truth, the gospel of your salvation, having also believed, you were sealed him with the Holy Spirit of promise. Friends, this is very crucial. This is crucial for all of us. We cannot apply these things. We cannot. We cannot have a godly perspective unless the Holy Spirit is in us. Unless the Holy Spirit lives in us. And the only way for the Holy Spirit to be with us or to be in us is that we need to first hear the gospel. And the gospel is this. Jesus loves you so much. But you are a sinner. Jesus or God is a loving God. But at the same time, He is also a holy God. He cannot tolerate sin. Therefore, you have been separated. We have been separated for God. For Separated from God. Why? Because of sin. But because God is a loving God, He knows that we cannot, we cannot fill the gap. And so He sent His only Son to die on the cross on our behalf so that the gap may be filled. And He resurrected on the third day to prove His claim that you, if you believe in Him, you will have eternal life and you will not perish. <clears throat> That's why it says here, having also believed. If you hear the gospel, you heard the gospel now, right? Okay, there's only three who heard the gospel. You heard the gospel now, right? Okay, your part is this, believe. You need to sincerely believe. You need to embrace that gospel. You say, Lord, I believe that you died for me. And I put my life on that, O oh Lord God. I will not be saved by my faith, but I will be saved by what you did. And now, Lord God, I am yours. I give my life to you because you gave my life to me. And if you believe that sincerely, genuinely, you will now be sealed with the Holy Spirit. It's called the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. And when the Holy Spirit is in you, He will now help you to have that godly perspective. 
you see things not only what it seems to be, but in the eyes of God. You know why? Because the Holy Spirit tells you so. I can't tell you. You can't even tell it yourself. It's the Holy Spirit that will teach you. Remember, Jesus said, the Holy Spirit is your teacher, your counselor, your helper. He will tell you things that you have never thought of before. When you go through the circumstance, He tells you, this is what you're going through. When you're now in that circumstance, where you're now in that success, He will tell you, that's why you are here for. You need to implement that purpose. And that is my prayer for all of us. As we go through the week, as we apply these wonderful principles in life that we pick up from Joseph, that we let the Holy Spirit teach us. You know why? You know why, friends? Let me give to you this final quotation or final thought. You were made by God and for God. And until you understand that, life will never make sense. All of those circumstances in your life will just be, you know, it's, it's mess. But until you understand that God loves you and God is holy and He died for you and He wants you to be with Him, until you get that, until you grasp that, then you will see that there is more than to what is happening in our lives. Then you will see the godly perspective. And as you tilt the picture, God has a better purpose for you than you ever thought. Let's all rise for our closing prayer. Let's pray. Father, Lord, we confess we can't do this, Lord. We can't do this apart from you. We can't have a godly perspective apart from you, Holy Spirit, to show it to us. Now, if you're that person and you've heard that gospel for the first time, if you're that person who just had that click and you just now understand what it really means, I invite you to pray this prayer with me. Father, Lord, I admit I am a sinner. And however and whatever I want to be so religious, I still fail. But Lord, now I understand that I don't have to be perfect because you gave Jesus who is perfect. Now I believe in you, Jesus, that you died, and you were buried, and you resurrected to prove your claim that whoever believes in you will not perish, but will have an eternal life. Teach me, Lord. Teach me and give me the Holy Spirit of promise so that I will be able, Lord God, to see a godly perspective that I might live this life, leaving a legacy. And Father Lord, we come here with different needs. We are here with needs of, you know, physically, financially, emotionally, mentally, in relationship, Lord God. Lord, I believe that you can meet all of those needs, Lord God. And I pray a special prayer for my brother, we are Ming Di. Lord, touch us his body, Lord God. Heal him, Lord. And Father, Lord, for those who are here who, who have now have that conviction from the Holy Spirit to apply all of these things that we have learned, allow us to become successful, Lord God, and experience, Lord God, to have that godly perspective. We bring you all the glory and praise. We love you, Lord, because you first love us. In Jesus' name we pray. Everybody say it.